Welcome to today's talk session. My name is Deidre Moss and I am the host of Can We Talk? I'm an educator, motivator, and a talk connoisseur. In our session today, we will focus and talk about cervical cancer awareness as July is recognized as Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. We thought that talking about cervical cancer awareness and prevention is still important and relevant. Today, we welcome Dr. Nina Graham to help us dissect this topic. So at this time, I will pass the virtual mic to our guest so that she can give us a brief introduction of herself. Hi, everyone. And um, January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Dr. Nina Graham, and I am a teal warrior. Teal, teal um, and white are the colors for cervical cancer. <clears throat> I am an obstetrician gynecologist, um, specialized, uh, and I work at the Princess Margaret Hospital in the obstetrics and gynecology department where I am, I, I basically am attached to the gyne oncology unit, mainly in the area of prevention. Um, I also work out of Family Medicine Center um, once a week, uh, where I'm the obstetrician gynecologist specialist there. And I also have my private practice right here in the Palmdale area, and it's called Femina. I also have, oh, I also have several Facebook pages. Um, Femina Bahamas, which is my business Facebook page. Um, and I do work a lot with women um, in menopause. And so I have a menopause page called the Menopause Lounge and a general um, women's page called Women's Health Tips and q and A's. I'm also on Instagram. And uh, yeah, I am... Um, an alumni of the St. Augustine's College, Big Red Machine, woo <laughs> And I am a graduate of the University of the West Indies and Marymount Manhattan College. I got my first degree there and I got my MBBS from, and my specialty from the University of the West Indies. I am a proud um, sorority member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Um, go Pelicans. <laughs> Pelicans. You, you, we. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. You, you, you got your, your credentials and so that's all you need. <laughs> Okay, so can we talk cervical cancer awareness and prevention? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, first of all, I would like to say that <clears throat> cervical cancer is a huge economic burden um, here in the Bahamas and um, in a lot of Caribbean countries or low socioeconomic countries. It is a preventable cancer and it is the only cancer that has an ideal screening test which is the pap smear and with the pap smear you can detect dysplastic or abnormal cells before it gets to cancer so um, cervical cancer is preventable Cervical cancer is the number one cancer of the female reproductive tract in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean. And unfortunately, we still get between 15 and 20 cases, new cases per year. The last count I think I saw was 16. So, the thing is, it's preventable through early detection, but many women are not getting screened. 
So that is the that is the main thing and my main focus. Now, of course, there is prevention also through the vaccine, the HPV vaccine. Um, but the most cost effective way is to do your pap smear. Um, and for those who know of the HPV vaccine, also that is an additional preventative measure. The problem is women don't do their pap smears and they only tend to do their pap smears, most of them, when they're pregnant, okay? And so most of the time in diagnosing women, uh, they give me the same story. And if you were to sit in my consultation room with these women, you would hear the same story. Oh, I haven't had my pap smear since my last child. All right. And you're hoping that their child is an infant or, you know, a young child, less than three. And the longest that I have, I have heard a woman tell me was well, she hadn't had a pap smear in 30 years. Or some of them say, I have never had a pap smear. The older generation will say, oh, I've never had a pap smear. And so I think that uh, we, uh, we as women need to be educated, definitely need to be educated on um, prevention first, because of course, prevention is better than cure. And um, we just need to be educated. And I'm sure after this talk, and I'm hoping that women feel more empowered through education. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you for sharing those interesting, um, that, that insight. But I wanted to ask you about your background. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you said you, well, you would have completed your program. You're from the Big Red Machine. Yeah, but can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? More? <laughs> oh, um, what would you like to know? Let me ask that. What would you like? What part of my life you are, you would like to know? You know I'm what I would girl. like to know? What, what inspired you to go into this particular field? Okay. Um, I have been in the area of gynae oncology for more than 10 years. Um, I didn't really want to specialize as much because I basically saw a lot of women die. Um, but I felt driven because, and I chose the area of service. Like I said, it's preventable and if they have a good screening tool. Um, and I realized because I work in the area of prevention, I see a lot of women. And when I start to speak to them about how cervical cancer is preventable and how you have to get your pap smears and the cause, they are like, what? You understand? So I realized that a lot of women are not educated in this area. Uh, I mean, in the cancers in general. Um, and when I have young women um, in, I think this lady was in her early thirties and she sat there and she came when she started bleeding. Now, a lot of times when you're bleeding, um, you may have missed the boat. And she sat there and she bled for a while and until I think her partner or her husband urged her to, to come in. And sometimes we tend to sit there, we're afraid. Um, and when she finally came in and I did her exam, I felt the cancer. And she said, Dr. Graham, please don't let me die. I have four children to live for. And, you know, when, when, when patients, you know, say that to you, you, you know, you want to do everything you could to help, but in her case, she, she wasn't even a candidate for surgery. All right. So she was past that surgical stage. Another lady, um, I, I deal with a lot of the abnormal pap smears. 
And every time I speak to a woman about the fact that her pap smear is abnormal, they automatically, and even though I'm sitting here and I'm saying we don't have cancer, but we need to deal with this, with this um, pre-malignant phase or this pre-cancer stage before it progresses to cancer. And I sit down there and I tell them you don't have cancer. And I have had a few women, quite a few women who left. All they heard was cancer. They left and never returned. And when they and then, no, they did return, but when they returned, it was too late. And so women get frightened from the pre-malignant phase. I don't know if anybody listened to the um to the Ask the Doc um, uh, broadcast that I did the part two. In the part two, we had a cancer survivor and we had someone who had an abnormal pap smear. And she spoke, the one with the abnormal pap smear, she spoke with so much fear how she felt and she was so afraid and all of the stuff. And, and how they um, relayed their story is exactly how almost every woman experiences. So, um, and, and I find that it, 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 it takes, I would have to sit down and literally talk them through it. And even when they come back, because sometimes they don't want to come, oh, talking or hurt. Oh, you get, you know, because if you have an abnormal pap smear, in most cases, you have to have a biopsy. So, oh, I don't want no pain, but you, you push a whole baby out though. <laughs> you know, would you worry about that pain? I don't want to say nothing like that. You know, and they get all fearful and don't want to come back. And, and it's so important. A lot of times we may, doctors may not have the time to really talk to patients when they're in the office. And that is very much needed. So there wouldn't be so much fear and stigmatism around cervical cancer. And, and women can try and beat this thing at the pre-malignant stage. Hmm? And so... I felt that it was something that I needed to do. Plus at that time, I mean, I always worked with um, the pre-cancer patients and cancer patients. I do surgery um, with the team, but I'm mainly in prevention. Um, but back in 2000, and, um, well, I was diagnosed with kidney disease from, I think it was 2003 or something like that. I lived with kidney disease for seven years before I got my transplant. And I wanted to do something. I wanted to give back in some way. I was so close to death that I didn't want to actually die and not have done something or not have left a mark to say, well, I did something. I did something for Bahamians. I did something for, my, for, for Bahamian women. And um, even though I'm not a, someone who has any of those cancers that I, the women that I see, I can still identify with the fear, the questions, the why me, the, oh, I just want to end it all. I can identify with that because I went through it um, myself with my own condition. So any chronic disease, be it cancer, kidney disease, hypertension, lupus, anything that's, that's a chronic thing, um, I do understand as a physician because I'm on, I was on both ends. I'm a physician and I was a patient. Y'all well, get a little you. more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that Dr. Graham and talking about that human side of it and the fact that you were kind of touched a little bit by, you know, a, a, a situation as well. So you kind of understand maybe that experience that the patient may have. And I want to thank you for sharing that. And also, you know, talking about those staggling facts, you said that, you know, you have persons come in and you told them, hey, this is um, maybe the early stages of cancer. And, you know, they didn't necessarily return until later down. And so I want to thank you for sharing that. And it's, it's very interesting. I think maybe it kind of strikes a little bit of fear. Um, but it's, yeah. Also, also too, um, some patients uh, decide to go the natural route. Oh, OK. All right. And then they leave when they were early stage, mm. leave and they say they're gonna do natural um, medicine. Okay. All right. By the time they come back to, they're far gone. 
Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And you talked about, uh, I just want to ask you, you talk about a patient who was um, came to you at the point where they were bleeding. And so maybe that that's a symptom. Um, maybe that's a symptom for someone. So bleeding from any particular area, if they discover they're bleeding. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that all malignancy for, of the female reproductive tract presents with bleeding. Mm. And so... Yeah, and so you're, it's vaginal bleeding. Okay. okay. Wow. So when I said her partner, her partner told her to go because a lot of times it, it interferes in the bedroom. And yeah. so the woman may not, may be fearful. Yeah. They, they deal with it because, you know, it's okay. But when the, the partner now says, listen, yeah. I don't really like to have sex with women bleed nor or it was okay with minimal bleeding, but now you're bleeding too much, something wrong. Yeah. Right? And a lot of times, uh, let me just say, uh, that is the most common presentation of all of, of, of cervical cancer. It is the most common presentation for uterine cancer. Now you may have some irregular bleeding with ovarian cancer, but ovarian mainly presents with uh, kind of mm, vague symptoms you know, dyspepsia, feeling full, indigestion, that kind of thing. And then when it's a little far gone, then they see their, their abdomen starting to get big. So ovarian um, presents more with a, 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 a mass in the, in the pelvis or in the belly. You may feel heaviness in the pelvis, or you may actually see your belly getting bigger. That's the most common presentation for ovarian. But uterine, cervix, vaginal, vulval cancers all present with um, bleeding. And the thing is, in women of reproductive age group, especially those who may be on the oral contraceptive pill or the shot, I mean, can, any you, type can of you just give us that, that age group? I know you called it off, but just... No, I said women of reproductive age. So anywhere okay. from in their 20s up until they reach menopause. Okay. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, we may have, um, uh, because women, and I'm going to talk about the postmenopausal women, um, when you go through menopause means you don't have any bleeding for a year. Right? So um, women of reproductive age group, though, may have different things that may also cause bleeding. And so it can be confusing. Um, women who are on the birth control, as I mentioned, may mm -hmm. that's you have to counsel your patient that hey, you're gonna have bleeding issues when right. you're on on some sort of birth control. Um, if a patient has a hormonal imbalance, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, or some other right. type of hormonal imbalance, they'll have abnormal bleeding. Yeah, I was um, just gonna ask you that, like, if you have bleeding, should you be scared? You know what I mean? I was I was just gonna ask you that. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's but, fine. <laughs> but on a, if you if you have a bleeding, should you just run for the hills? Should you just be scared and terrified? Some people do, and then like I like I'm saying, some 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 women say, well, oh, I bleeding because of my my birth control this month or whatever, or oh, I bleeding because I have fibroids, or oh, I bleeding. You understand? And you may have fibroids. You may be bleeding because of the birth control, but how about, hey, I may be bleeding because I have a cancer? No, that's the last thing they're thinking about. And so hence the delay, because we as women, we have everything to do. Oh, you gotta go away, you gotta do your hair and makeup, you gotta work, you gotta take care of the kids, you gotta take care of your husband, you gotta do this and do that. And they stay, they just do whatever they um, have to normally do and put this bleeding on the back bench and say, oh, and they basically diagnose themselves, oh, I'm bleeding because of this. And so the last thing they wanna do is go to the physician and say, I'm bleeding, I need to be checked out. That's the last resort when I say, in most cases, the partner say, nah, look here, you giving me problems in the bedroom, you need to go deal with that, right? And some women, they're okay. I mean, I shouldn't say they're okay with it, they're bothered by it. And I think in a lot of cases, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, oh, this may be something serious. So they're too afraid to go, right? And, and, and when they actually present, 
some of them, they have missed the boat. Okay. But if you had your regular pap smears, you would have picked up abnormal cells before the bleeding. So that's what I'm trying to tell. Where in a lot of cases, you know, for years, you'd be like, oh, I've been on the birth control for three years. I've been having this irregular bleeding. And that may be so. But the point is, you need to check it out. You need to do an annual. You need to have a gynecologist and you need to have it checked out. Okay. Now, women, postmenopausal women who have stopped bleeding for, for a year or more, come in and tell me, oh, they say, and this is a myth. Oh, you could bleed after you stop bleeding. It, it means that you're young again. I remember a woman told me that. And I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry. Could what? you repeat that? Could you repeat that again? I'm so sorry. Um, but before you do, before she you said, do, I just want to before you do, I just want to mention Vivian Peter from Jamaica. Hi, Vivian. Thank you for listening. Um, she says interesting topic and Lin Lynetta Weaver, good information. Thank you so so much, um, Lynetta, for joining us today. Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, please let us know or uh, write it in the comments. But um, um, um Dr. Graham, could you repeat that? Yes, I have had a couple older older women like in their late 60s, 60s 70s and a lot of them are from the island <laughs> I don't know if I don't know where that came from but yes I they say that when you have your period again that means you um, um, you're getting young again so um uh -huh. it's the, uh -huh. and so a couple of them sat there until their children found out because of course they if they if they don't live with their children they don't come until it's really bad But if they live with a child and they notice, um, you know, something red in the pampas or whatever, the children or the, the child would come and, and investigate. But the patient themselves, they would do what? Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. Oh, okay, Dr. Graham, I'm, I'm trying to understand this now. Mm -hmm. So you're 60, you're 60 or 70, and you have went through menopause, you stop your men menstruation, and all of a sudden now you see bleeding and you're not concerned, you think you're going through your period again? Mm-hmm. Yes, oh, wow. They ain't thinking, they ain't thinking cancer. No. And then, I mean, for some women, it, it's not it's not cervix, it's uterine. And then I go and examine them and they have a big old mass in their belly. You, 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 you ain't feeling the belly getting bigger. You, you, what, what? No. Sometimes they be in denial too, eh? <laughs> But yeah, those are some of the things. So that is a myth. Some people feel as though they're getting young again and, and that type. As a matter of fact, I had a lady call me today um, while I was at my other job um, in Family Medicine Center. And she was and she's a patient here. And she said, Doc, when I was passing you and I, I, I passed a little bit of blood. Um, um, is that okay? Should I, should I? I said, no, you need to come. You know, because, and, and, and if they bleed, like if they pass in urine and wipe and they bleed once, um, and it doesn't happen again for another month or so, and then they bleed again. And there, there are several instances where they just have these little episodes of bleeding. And I tell women, if you're postmenopausal and you have any bleeding at any time, that's abnormal. Whether it's cervix, bladder cancer, whatever, it's abnormal, you know? And she, and the lady told me, well, Dr. Graham, cause she had an abnormal pap before I've been managing this woman from her abnormal pap. She said, when you, when you did the biopsy, you said that I had a polyp. I said, oh, okay. Because I didn't have a notes in front of me. I said, oh, oh okay. So she said, do I still need to come? I said, yes, <laughs> because polyps, polyps are benign lesions so she feels though oh it ain't cancer then you know I said no I still have to sample your uterus I said I can take out the polyp that's no problem but are you bleeding from the polyp or are you bleeding from a cancer up further up no you need to come so can you tell us what for those who may not know what is a, a polyp I'm sorry a polyp is a benign growth right? That you could either have it um, in the cervix or you could have it in the uterus. It's just a benign growth. 
Um, sometimes it's asymptomatic. You may not have bleeding from it. And sometimes uh, you may have bleeding and in that case, we take it out. But when you take it out, of course, you send it to the lab to make sure that there's no cancer in it, but usually they're benign. And when, when you look at um, the differential for bleeding, um, bleeding um, that you're thinking is in this uh, uh, uterine or cervical area, um, and you're looking at the uterus, you could say, okay, sometimes the uterus um, um, thicken. Uh, normally it thickens before you ovulate, right? So that, but afterwards there's something when it abnormally thickens, you say it's, it's um, um, hypoplasia of the uterus. And, and that happens, that can happen because you're on the birth control. It can happen according to where you are in your cycle, okay? So if it's thickened, right, um, and you sample the uterus and it says hyperplasia, that's like a pre-malignant condition for the uterus, okay. right? And so that person, you still need to monitor them because they can, it can change, all right? Because it goes through benign and if it continues, it can become cancerous. So you need to sample the person's uterus every now and again to make sure it hasn't changed. And especially if they're still having bleeding. So any type of bleeding from the reproductive tract is, isn't, isn't a good sign for me. And I always tell my patients, I, I, am a, I deal with gynecology. And the first thing I want to do and the thing that will kill you is cancer. So I am going to check and look and screen and do everything I can to rule out cancer. And then the, the polyps and the hyperplasia and the pre-malignant stuff we'll deal with. But I need to exclude cancer. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to go to our comments. Lynetta Weaver saying what this is why we need to be educated about this, because it's sad how folks believe more in a myth than facts. Miss um, Clark is saying, good afternoon. I think that women of color are somewhat reluctant to go for yearly checkups, because that is something that is not practiced in the home or in our culture. It's similar to the myth surrounding mental health and people of color. We don't go to the therapist or psychologist. We deal with it on our own. Good mm -hmm. info, she says. Um, and Lynetta Weaver saying, that's true. Now you don't even have to get a check, check up yearly. It's every five year, years, if it's normal. So what, what about the checkup, uh, of Dr. Graham? Is it every five years or? <sighs> That person is from the state thing. <laughs> I, I believe so. Lynetta, can you let us know where you're from in the comments, please? Um, Thank you. In the States, I think it's every three to five years, according to their guidelines. In the Bahamas, nuh uh. No, you got to come and see me. For me, as your physician, I want yeah, to. She, yeah, she's from the US. Thank you, Lynetta. Thank you so much. Yes every other year in the Bahamas. See, big countries like the United States, um, um, United um, Great Britain, and all these uh, uh, countries have good call and recall systems. They have all sorts of things in place. They have, I mean, they have thin preps and stuff. We only do thin preps in the private offices. We still do conventional preps in our clinics. Okay, and the, and the conventional pap smear is not as, the yield of cells is not as good as a, as a, as a thin prep. Hold on, let me find a thin prep. Um, I just finished doing a, a pap party and every one of them had thin preps. Okay, okay. So you before it, I did conventional paps because it depends on who sponsors it. Okay, um, okay. Okay, so we'll give you a few seconds to get that thin, thin prep. I don't want to pronounce the wrong name. This is okay. a thin prep. Okay? Okay. And you use, you do basically the same way you would do a, a conventional pap, but you're not smearing it on a slide. Because okay. when you smear it on a slide, you can get the discharge and the mucus and everything you collect that along with the pre-malignant cells. Okay. 
And so it could be a challenge for the, for the cytologist to read that. But when you have a thin prep, you take the brush and you put it in the solution. And so you're kind of like washing off the cells, right? And so this is more accurate. Okay. We don't have, we don't have this available in the public setting here. Wow. All right. Because it's more costly. Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and, um, but I'm not saying that the conventional pap, if you, if, if the conventional pap is better than nothing. Okay. Same thing. Um, in some countries, African countries and so forth, if you get an abnormal pap smear, in most, in most cases, um, if it's abnormal, you need a biopsy. In some African countries, they don't even have a colposcopy machine. All right? A colposcopy um, or a colposcope is a machine used to look at the cervix closer and you put solutions on the cervix to identify abnormal cells. A lot of countries don't have colposcopes. All right, I'll show you what a colposcope looks like. Lord, I showed you a lot in my office. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, let me take it off. And so it looks like binoculars. Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. And okay. so you, you look at you look at the cervix closely to that. Okay. And you identify areas that look abnormal and then you take a biopsy. Okay. okay. So some countries don't even have that available. And so you have to, unfortunately, you have to work with what you have. Right? And, right. and this is my reasoning for even doing uh, Cervical Cancer Awareness Month or Cervical Health Awareness Month every January. Because, well, this is the first time I'm showing with my instruments, but I got to give them a little bit, a little bit. But I need women to know the importance of this. And not only that, it's preventable. Yeah. <laughs> if you just do this little thing in here. <laughs> It's and I can hear how passionate I can hear how passionate you are about it because you know that it's something that it's it's a preventable it's preventable. And I but I wanted to women. get back to basis basic, uh, Doctor Graham. For those who may not fully understand, could you just explain to us as simply as you can what is cervical cancer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cervical cancer is. It starts off as a pre-malignant pre -malignant cells on the cervix, okay? And depending on their different grades of the cells. So you have what we call a low-grade um, cell or low-grade lesion. I'm going to give you the long word. And then that goes all the way up to a high grade lesion. Now, cervical cancer is very slow growing. So it takes about, if someone has been, oh, by the way, most women don't know this, but cervical cancer, the cause is a sexually transmitted infection. That's a can, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, they don't know. It's caused by a virus. A sexually transmitted infection. So back in the day when I was growing up, and I, yeah, I know I make me sound old, but everybody used to talk about claps and gonorrhea. I don't even remember hearing when I was young about chlamydia too much, um, syphilis. All right, nobody ever spoke about the human papilloma virus. You heard about herpes, um, and 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 trichomatosis. Us, yeah. <laughs> Right? But only, I would say, in the last 25, 30 years, maybe, you, you hear a lot more about the human papillomavirus. And the human papillomavirus is the virus, it has many subtypes. 
not all of them cancer causing. As a matter of fact, the human papilloma virus also causes genital warts. That's the same virus. Now we used to hear about warts, but they never used to say anything about cancer, right? And so, and so most women don't know that. So you get, a, you get an infection with the human papilloma virus. And let's say you don't, you don't do a pap smear. You won't be able to tell how the involvement or the effect the human papilloma virus had on your cervix, right? Um, so you can have anywhere from a low grade lesion lesion to a high grade lesion. If it takes normally about seven plus years to develop cancer. So it's slow growing, right? And that is why you can catch it at, at these stages and manage it so it doesn't get to cancer. But if you don't do your paps, you wouldn't know what stage you are and you can monitor if it's, if it's getting to cancer and you can not treat if you never do your pap smears. And so if the, there is full thickness of, of your cells or are abnormal, the cells of the cervix sit on a basement membrane or are, are buffer cells like this. So if you have the full thickness of your cells being abnormal, after about five years or so, this basement membrane gets um, gets laxed and the cells feed its way through, break it, feed its way through and the abnormal cells go into the blood system. That is cancer. So what we tend to do is we're catching the abnormal cells at the stage before it breaks through the basement membrane. Mm. So the precancerous stage is the stage where you're getting abnormal cells involving if, if you don't do anything, the full thickness. So you need to catch them at that stage. And it's at that stage, it is picked up, the, the pap smear picks up the various stages of abnormal cells. But if you can sit home there and twiddle your thumbs, and pontificate as to why you ain't going to do your annual, oh, I ain't got enough money, I gotta put the children, da da da. Then by the time you reach there and you start bleeding, then it's an issue. And okay. then when you have it go into the, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you can, you can finish, you can finish. Then when it goes into the bloodstream, then it starts to involve first surrounding structures, then distal structures. So some women come at different stages. Some women will be bleeding and they still don't do nothing. And then some women will come when they get pain. That means it moves somewhere, either right there in the pelvis or distantly. It can affect the bones. They start to have shortness of breath. They go into the lungs. They start to act senile and crazy. It go into the brain. And it just moves all over your body through your blood and lymph nodes. Oh, wow. Yes. Dr. Graham, can, can you tell us about stats? So you talked about, uh, you talk about uh, the, the cancer going into the bloodstream and, and the, various, the various stages, but can you tell us about stats? Particularly as it pertains to the rate of cervical cancer in the Bahamas? Okay, what I can tell you is the um, the new cases that have been that have come up every year? So over the last two to three years, it has gone from from 10, 10 or twelve new cases to fifteen. That's new cases. So that's a bit of an increase. Yes, it's not getting less. Do we know what leads to the increase? Is there any particular reason as to why? Women aren't doing their paps. Mm. 
So let's talk about prevention. What can we do to prevent cervical cancer? Your paps. <laughs> I know it's important to come in and get those screenings. Um, it's the pap smear and it's the, the vaccine. The HPV. Yes. Yes, and, and, and that's another thing. Women aren't aware of um, some of them, not all of them but women aren't aware that there's a vaccine. And then we don't quite understand what vaccines do. So they feel as though if they get the vaccine, then the infection that they have is going to be treated. And they say, oh, that's gonna treat. I said, there the word is, treat. I said, it does not treat because viruses, right? Viruses act by going into the cells and changing around the machinery, just like the COVID or HIV or hepatitis, you don't really get rid of it. Now, HPV is different in a sense that once the immune system is very good, then there's a chance that you can, um, that you can get rid of your infection or you can, you can rid your body. And that's why we don't do, um, we don't do uh, HPV statuses on persons less than 30, okay? Because the younger population, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a sexually transmitted infection. And, you know, young people are experimenting and they're, you know, they're doing lots of stuff. So if we go and do, and that's why we don't do pap smears before the age of 21 either, because if that's the case, a whole host of young people will be positive. Oh, and, wow. and, and because their immune systems are good, they clear the virus easily. As you get older, old girls can't do that. <laughs> we can't clear it as good. So, so we have to get, keep a closer eye on the, on the older population, the young people could, you know. Now that don't, don't get me wrong, there are young people that can develop um, that can develop cervical cancer and they have been younger people. But generally um, it occurs, the younger people could, could um, clear the virus. And so just like HIV, HIV, um, the, the, the AIDS virus goes in, change around the machinery. Once you have HIV, you have HIV. Um, and then the, the um, symptoms or could, what the HIV causes, whether it's an ammonia, skin manifestations, whatever, you treat those, but you still have HIV. So in the older population, what happens is um, we treat, we biopsy, and, and, and hey, we find out, hey, um, this is stage two or whatever, pre-malignant, then we go ahead and we manage that patient. Um, so the, uh, um, the virus is prevention. The vaccine, sorry, is prevention. So take for instance, if you come to me, you have an abnormal pap smear, I biopsy you, we treat or we don't treat and everything is fine for a while. I monitor you. I normally monitor my patients for two years with pap smears and pap smears every six months and then a year. And if they're fine and they're, they're, their pap smears have come back normal after that for several years, and then all of a sudden, poof, five years later, another thing comes up. That means that either um, you, you, uh, you had what we call a persistent infection, right? Of which when you get the vaccine, the vaccine is not treatment, it's prevention. So if you had the most common um, cancer causing uh, subtypes for HPV is 16 and 18. So let's say you've got a, an infection with a 16, then, and you have a persistent infection, that 16 doesn't go away. It may lie dormant, but it doesn't go away if you have a persistent infection. So if you take the, if you take the vaccine, it will protect you against the 18. We can't do nothing but the 16 because you don't have it. Wow. Yeah. Um, Ms. Weaver is saying, I encourage parents to get their sons and daughters to shot for HPV once they hit 13. What do you think? 
Oh, absolutely. We do it at age 12 and 13 here. And um, it's on the immunization schedule, just like the MMR and the DPT and all of that. And the reason for that is that we're trying to eradicate cervical cancer. And um, if you start before the children get become sexually active, then there's a possibility of eradicating it in the next generation. The problem is this generation who didn't have it, right? So I, I totally agree with that. But again, you're gonna have some parents who disagree with it, don't wanna vaccinate their kids and that type of thing. And so those patients um, will slip through the cracks. And so when they get older, the men, you know, may pass it on to, you know, women and that type of thing. Um, and then, of course, you cannot, you cannot do anything about the sex, um, sexually assaulted young child or the sexual molestation of younger children, because um, even though they, they may not have had the vaccine at that point, and so they are still at risk or exposed. Wow. You know, wow. Risk. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those facts. Um, Lynetta Weaver says she appreciates your, your, your tour, the little tour that you gave us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so I want to ask you about initiatives. You, you talked about, you know, being inspired and, and, and how you would have kind of ventured into the area that you're in now. And so I want you to tell us, because I know you're doing some things. Uh, I'm going to share your flyer as well, because I know you have an upcoming um, teal. I tried to put some teal in there. <laughs> I tried. I know you have a teal. <laughs> I know you have a teal party coming up. So can you tell us about any initiatives <laughs> that you're doing? <laughs> um, well, actually, this is um, the end of January. The whole month of January, um, um, we we did we had initiatives um, for the whole month, and I've been doing this now for five years. Um, every year I do a lot of talk, a lot of interviews as I'm doing now. Um, and every time I either go also on TV, on the radio, um, to, to, um, yeah, that's it on the radio to, um, just again, give facts, educate the public. And, um, every year we have Teal Fridays where, um, we encourage the general public to wear teal. As you can see, I have my teal dress on. That's, this is green teal. And this is more the blue teal. Yeah, there's two, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, the colors for cervical cancer are teal and white. So we encourage um, the general public to wear teal and white on Fridays. Um, I remember the first year we did a, we did a tea party and, cop and um, fashion show. Um, that was successful and um what did we do last year i don't think i did too much last year but this year uh well every time we've had our pack our pack party so um i basically encourage women to get their pap smears at that time if you know some women do it on their birth in their birth month um but if they don't if there's not a set time i encourage women to do their packs in the month of january and so I have an annual pop party. Um, and uh, I uh, reduce the cost of the pop smears at that time so that women could be encouraged and they, you know, they'd be like, oh, I can't afford it, and this and that. Um, and so, so we do a pop party. And this year I also did an extra event <laughs> called the, um, the Teal Pillow Talk. And this is basically going to be a virtual um, pajama party that's come, that's happening tomorrow between the hours of eight and ten. And basically, it's again um, a talk on cervical cancer, and um, along with it, we're going to have some some games and quizzes and and things to really excite women and, and get them on board and. And, and give them more information about really what um, cervical cancer is. So even in the quiz, I'll be asking questions. I'm gonna be educating while I'm quizzing you. <laughs> so, 
So, um, and so it gives me a chance to educate through fun. And, um, you know, different risk factors, like risk, risk factors, a lot of women don't know that, um, that cervical cancer is caused by a sexually transmitted infection. So one of the things we're gonna have tomorrow, oh, I shouldn't say, anyway, one of the things I'm having tomorrow is a scavenger hunt. And one of the things you gotta look for in your house is a condom. So it kind of relates. Um, some oh, wow. Of the, okay. It, it relates some of the education to, to what we're going to be looking for wow. and, and, and different things. So women will be educated and they'll say, well, okay, um, some <laughs> of the risk factors for, for cervical cancer, X, Y, and Z. And they, I want them to be able to spit that out to me afterwards. I'm a teacher. I'm a teal warrior. I want, the, All I right. want you all to know exactly what I know. And if y'all know what I know, then y'all will be getting <laughs> your pops now. <laughs> All right. So Dr. 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 Graham, if I want to be a part of it, who do I have to email somebody? What what do I have to do to be a part okay. of it? Well, seeing that it's seeing that it's tomorrow, um, because I already uh, everyone that um sent in their emails and stuff, I already sent a, 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 a mass email last night. Um, but I'm fine finding to that um um if you WhatsApp the number on the flyer. Um, I'll just, I'll just right now at this point, I'll just send you the Zoom link. All right, it's free, it's virtual, and one of the things we we're encouraging to, um, um, we're, we're giving prizes, um, and uh, who has the nicest um, pajamas or, or or nightwear? Who has their setup? You know. Um, you know, the nice wine and whatever. So you have prizes too. You have some good prizes too. Bandwidth. You're going to get a prize. Okay. prizes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just got some, a few persons who own businesses because corporate Bahamas is not, is not yet on board with my, my cervical health awareness month in January. So a lot of times in the Bahamas, they make a big, a big to do about, sir, about breasts. Mm-hmm. So it is my dream that yeah. um, one of these Januaries that the whole, all, all the streets are painted in teal, uh, everything. Absolutely. Because and, at the end of the day, the, the, the stats are, are startling. And the thing it is, um, I encourage women so much because you can get a pap smear for less than $100, okay? The government is for each woman, the, the, if you're not a candidate for surgery, then the, the management is radiation. For each woman, radiation is $15,000. So my wow. question to women, my question is, do you take um, time out once a year and get your paps for a hundred or less than hundred dollars a year. If you if you find a pop party like mine, you can do it for less than hundred dollars a year. Or do you want to have to um, burden the government for and 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 of course the government pays ten thousand. The family has to come up with five thousand. And do you know, Miss Moss? Sometimes it's difficult to come up with five thousand yeah. dollars. And I have seen women die because they cannot afford oh my treatment. God. They cannot afford treatment. Okay, so it to me it makes no logical sense that you would not get a pap smear, even if you don't have the, the vac, even if you don't get the vaccine. It makes no sense. So I always tell women, you choose. You come up with one hundred dollars, or you have to come up with five thousand dollars, and even less than one hundred dollars, as you would have mentioned, it could be less. Yes, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. So could you provide recommendations? What recommendation would you put forward as we, you know, try to address cervical cancer? This is a real thing. Um, we have so many women who are impacted. You talk about the fact that, you know, we often talk about breast cancer and, and, and everyone wears the pink. And but what about the teal? What about the, the what about the, the teal? So can you can you tell us, can you put forward some recommendations on, on what can we do? How can we address cervical cervical cancer? You talk about buy-in from corporate Bahamas as well. That's the first thing. The public needs to be educated. Okay. I think the um, initiative with breasts was very good. And it had 
it, 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 it did what it was supposed to do and it's still doing what it's supposed to do. And so um, I think you get a better turnout with breast every year because now women are educated. We are educated on doing self breast exams. We're educated to check underneath the arm to see if there's any lumps. Now, mind you, there's some, some stuff is still going on, but the majority of the population is educated and they know, hey, every year or every other year, I need to, I need to do my mammogram. Some women will come in and tell me, oh yeah, I do that mammogram every year, but I have dense breasts. They know about dense breasts and they know what, what is malignant and fibrocystic changes. And they know these things because, because so much emphasis has been placed on breasts and everywhere, especially in October, it's in your face. Pink is in your face. Even, even when um, sometimes last year, I had a, a campaign where I said teal, teal meets breasts because I wanted to, to, to get in on, on, on breasts also but I wanted you to know, hey, breast is the number one cancer in women in the Bahamas. But most of y'all don't know that cervical cancer is the number one um, cancer of the female reproductive tract in the Bahamas. So you have, because breast isn't considered the, re, the, the reproductive tract. And so I think that it should be a joint effort with corporate Bahamas because there's so many things I could do, so many things, I, so many ideas, but... Um, it's just, uh, you don't have the money. Most of my pop, pop, my pop campaigns, this whole month is done by me. Meaning I, I would put money in, like if you go in and, and you go online and you see the decorations in my office, these are things that I do to raise awareness for me. And I have a few friends and for the, for the, um, for the pajama party, I was like, um, can you can you give me a, a, a gift certificate for a makeover? Can you give me a gift certificate for a massage? It's not for me. It's not putting money in my pocket, but just to help to raise awareness so I can put on this pajama party because people say, oh, yeah, well, what you doing for me or whatever. So I wanted it to be fun and I want it to be educational. I actually want to get something done even in the schools for the kids because these kids need to know, hey, y'all are out here having sex. How's about using a condom? Um, let me tell you what this could cause. You know, have the kids wear the teal cancer ribbons, you know, so that you could turn around and ask. I remember the first year I did a campaign and I put the bowls in the, I thought, I said, where do people go all the time? And I was like, hey, let's, let's do it in the gas stations. Everybody's going for gas. Everybody's going to the little store to buy little things. I don't know if you saw it about three years ago, all of the stations had these little teal bowls, teal bowls, teal. Me and a friend of mine, I was like, come, we got the teal bowls made up and we went to every, we got permission and all of the stations that allowed us to do it there, tying up the teal bowls and stuff like that. Some people came in there and didn't even bother, right? And some people say, what that is? Why these up here? And this is That's what wild. I want. Yes. <laughs> we even we even tied them up in the public clinics we got permission and do you know the people came i was at a particular clinic fleming street and do you know the people just walk in and out the clinic and even ask what that is i was like really <laughs> i was like how could you not see that big bone ox what is it <laughs> But some people are going to get it and some people aren't. But I figured yeah. we do it enough. Like, you know, for I think um, for the, 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 the peach bowls are for, um, I think, um, no, uh, the peach bowls you see around, I think it's for a violence cool. or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that represents that as well. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I, I when I first saw it, I was like, why people have that bow up there? And I started yeah. asking questions. You started asking. Yeah. Yes, and, I just figure people are inquisitive. Oh, gender-based violence. Yeah, gender-based <laughs> violence. Yeah, yes. yeah. And so you do things. These are some of the things that you do to raise awareness. I mean, you would think that people would be inquisitive enough to ask, hey, what that for? And then you talk about violence or whatever. And then, you know, you start to find a little thing. Start the talk, conversation. Start the conversation. Yeah. yeah. So I think that corporate Bahamas needs to need, like, even if you have one thing attached to breast, one thing attached to lupus, one, you know, so like if the insurance company, let's say Kalina, 
they're the ones that, oh, that, let me give you another example. You know, for, for junk canoe, they have the shell sacks and superstars, so all a shell and whatever. And then you have another one that, that sponsors another group. It should be like that for, for, for awareness campaigns um, in the month of January or, or, or in the month of October. Um, and there are very, various other causes that people don't even know about. Um, uh, there's a huge, a very huge base I have of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. I met a woman walk in my office and I see all of the hair on their face and the acne. And I say, you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. They look at me like, what? What that is? And people walk around and they don't even know that that, that, that they no. and then by all, this. all of a sudden when they want to have children and can't have none, they'd be like, and I say, take off the mask, you know? And I wow. look and mm -hmm. I see your polycystic ovarian. So how 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 were you able to point that out? Is the hair or the? Well, they come with a history of infertility. Oh wow! And and the hair, and um, they also have abnormal bleeding. Oh wow! But before I actually do any um, hormonal studies, any pelvic ultrasound, well, that's my working diagnosis until proven otherwise. Oh, wow. I had a young lady said her, she, she has had abnormal periods from she st first started having a period at uh, 13. She said she would have a period this month and then she wouldn't have a period till probably April. I say, you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. She said, what that is? I didn't know. And she's now 25. Right. And she says, you know something, there are other, there are some of my other friends who have the same problem. I said, and the problem is it's never diagnosed until you come to me and say you can't get pregnant and you want to get pregnant. I said, but you could have been managed from you were a teenager. So there's several, that, 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 that's, uh, what I said that to say there's, there are certain um, conditions and, and different cancers and stuff that, that the Bahamas needs to, to be aware of. And, and it's not just breasts, colon cancer. Is very common. Prostate. Prostate. Nobody, nobody really, you know. These, these are very important. And, and I want to thank you for, for your work that you're doing in this. And actually, you know, taking all the time to have this, this to talk and share your insight and sharing your knowledge. Because we need to know these things. We need yeah. to we need to have an awareness of, of these things, especially for the fact that you said cervical cancer is the number one cancer for the reproductive tract. So how does that impact us um, as a as a as a young woman? You're looking forward to getting married and having a child. How how, how are you impacted by, by that? These are important things that no, no, sorry, and it should oh. not and it should not be because your family was affected by it. Mm -hmm. I don't have any in my anyone in my family with cervical cancer. Hmm. but um um it's still something that you can get involved in yes and I, I yes I work with these people but I'm very passionate about it I don't have a family member the 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 people that I diagnose in the clinic are my family members I guess you would call it you know but it, it's just very disheartening because it's a preventable cancer yeah I, yes. I can't say that enough yes yes no, and I mean, I had my pop party, but it wasn't as many people as I would like, you know, and I would really like for all of the uh, obstetrician gynecologists to have a pop party in their office. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would love for all of them to do it. Yes. It's not, it, it, it's not all about you know, you could be making money as a physician and do well and still give back in your own little way, however it is. Yes. Oh, um, and this is my give back. This Thank you. Thank you for giving back. This is my give back. Thank you. And so advice, um, what advice would you give to an individual who might be impacted by cervical cancer or what advice would you give to and well you already you talked to us about you know coming in and getting the pap but if you found that you you have, you have cervical cancer um and you 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 may you may you're looking forward to certain 
milestones in your life. What advice would you give to, to that individual? Um, who is diagnosed with cervical cancer? I would tell them to dream. So whatever they had to dream in their, um, their goals before they had cervical cancer, keep them and to fight. Don't let it um, take you down or don't go without a fight. So take for instance, um, and I take that from my own experience. There are many times when I wanted to give up, all right? And um, I just wouldn't allow myself to. Many times I'm tired. I used to, I used to go to work, uh, my, my blood count, your blood count's supposed to be like near 12, right? I used to go to work with a blood count of five. And when your blood count is low, you're just tired. So by the time I walk from the, from the um, parking lot to the front of the hospital, I'm exhausted and tired. Many days I had to talk to myself. I had to pray and talk to myself. Don't give up. And the family support is extremely important. So for persons who have persons in their family, they need you. Get the support you need from your family. There are support groups around. Find out what the support groups are. Get involved. Fight together. Fight together. You go down fighting. Go down fighting, but always fight. Always fight. If they, if, if you're feeling, if you're feeling tired or you, you have some sort of symptom after your chemotherapy and stuff like that, a lot of people, they come to clinic and you tell them they have to go to the emergency room and they'd be like, man, I feel like going there again, man. I, I, I know, man. You know, especially during this time with COVID, many of the patients would be like, uh-uh, no, I, I don't go. And it's really, it's really tiring having to visit the emergency room, have to sit down for hours, mostly the whole day, you know, all around all kind of a bunch of other people. You don't want to do it. But my mantra the whole time I had kidney disease was you do what you got to do so you could do what you want to do. So if they told me my fistula was infected and I have to go, go and get an IV antibiotics and be in the hospital for two, three days, man, I used to cry and kick and scream. I don't want to go again. I want to go. And I used to get up and pop my bags and go. Right? Because I won't go back to work. I want to do things. So you do what you got to do to stay alive so you could do what you want to do. And whether that is to become a best-selling author, to become whatever you want to do. The things that are coming at you, just let it roll off and do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Do what you got to do to do what you want to do. Thank you, Dr. Graham. For the My mantra for yourself. years. <laughs> My mantra for years. And as we come to the end of this session, Dr. Graham, because I know you're so busy. I know you're a busy lady. Uh, do you have any additional comments you would like to add? Um, no, just women, put yourself first. It's not a bad thing to put yourself first because in doing that, then you could work with everybody else. Put yourself first and at least once a year, put your health first do your annuals and, and do whatever tests and everything you need to do once, just once a year and put yourself first. That's all I got. Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. And, and that's so powerful in and of itself. You know, sometimes we, I, I always remember um, those 
demonstrations in the plane on the, those movies where they say, you know, before you can do anything, you have to put on the mask over you first before you can help other persons. Yeah. So as you said, sometimes you got to put yourself first. You got to take care of yourself first in order for you to be there for your loved ones. Because yeah. if you fall out and you drop down, who's going to be there? You, you want to be there for them. So you have to take care of your health first. Yes. So I want to thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Graham. And you have so many wonderful social pages. Ah. Hey, share those pages, Dr. Graham. <laughs> yes, um, and one's coming up soon, another one. <laughs> um, but yes, I have my um, practices Facebook page called Femina Bahamas. And um, that basically, I put up little things, um, little, little snips of of mainly it's it's what's happening that month um, and uh, just information and what's coming up any special things that I'll be um, involved in. And then um, there's the menopause lounge, the menopause lounge. And that came out of um, my own experience of going through menopause. Uh, well, you know, the doctor, I, as a doctor, I didn't even know what was happening to me. I think I was going crazy. Um, <laughs> I was was like, oh wow that's powerful <laughs> hey I pull up in front of my office and I bust out cry and I'm like what, what's that what's going on what's going, what's, what's going wow. on <laughs> so that's that, powerful. That, yeah so that came out of my own experience but it's a it's a it's a, a Facebook page for women to share knowledge um share information um and um uh, and it's just there for support um and then it's women's health tips and q a's is another um a medical um facebook page just for general medicine or general well mainly OBGYN. sorry but at one point i was also um i'm actually a um i was trained by the institute of of um integrative institute of nutrition and so um, I used to do stuff on diet because, you know, diet is very linked to a lot of conditions. So I would put stuff on diet on various um, uh, conditions that women occur, educational things. Um, so it's a whole variety of, it's not just geared towards one particular thing on that page. That was the first page I ever did. So those are my Facebook pages. And coming soon is a PCOS page, which um, I'm going to be working on pretty soon. And then, of course, my Instagram page. Oh, also on Facebook, I have my personal page, you know, just about me. But Instagram, um, I have a personal page. Uh, it has a medical twist, but it's what I am doing. And then my business Instagram page. And also soon coming is TikTok. <laughs> I'm on TikTok. Hey, okay. I am. I am now learning. I don't know anything about TikTok, but I'm hearing that that's the thing. So hey. um, I have a. I my son is 12 and he's into TikToks. So I'm like, baby, you're gonna have to help me with TikToks. Yeah, he, he got you. So he's he promises yeah. he's gonna he's gonna try. He's gonna make sure you. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Graham, you're on TikTok, hey. Yes, yes, but it's, it's it, not too much is on it yet. Um, yeah. I'm still trying to learn it a bit. Yeah, so, um, and of course, I'm on LinkedIn and, you know, all of those other things. So. Yes, yes, so you're everywhere. You're, you're on, utilizing. Are you on Twitter? No, I am not okay. on Tell Okay, tell son, he needs, he needs to jump on that, too. We need to get you up on Twitter. Do they still do Twitter? Yes. Yes, Dr. Graham. He needs to he needs to set you up on Twitter. Tell him. Wow. Yes. Well, on one, of, one of the things that I did want to get set up on, and I always did to do um talks like this, uh, you know, like a women's podcast or something. Um, that's something I definitely would like to do. Um, but there's so many different avenues to get the word out there. Yes. And um, I'm trying to use as many avenues as I as I could. Um, to raise awareness. Um, and that's, that's, that's my aim. And if I can just get it out there, then yes. I, could, I could step down, y'all take it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we need you. We need your expertise. We need you. But you want to reach people where they're at. You want to reach people where they are. So I want to thank you as well for having all those mediums um, to reach out to your audience. 
And yes, so and, and I, I, I'm, I'm very, very appreciative of the, of the invitation because I always, um, especially in the month of January, I always love to raise awareness um, for cervical cancer. And um, I thank you for the invitation because I find that this, this year, I have gotten more persons outside of the normal radio stations. And so I didn't even do the radio stations because so many people were asking me mainly from either ZNS or social media. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so if I can get, if I can get it out there, even that way, um, that's wonderful. So, hey, you guys, you can go and visit my Facebook pages and, and follow. Instagram. Follow and yeah, follow, like, and share and all of those nice things when you, when you, when you come even on TikTok. Okay. Yes. Hey. I'm going to, I'm going to be learning how to do the, this, do some videos. Yeah. This, <laughs> <laughs> yes yes i we love yes, so just look me up and 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 i always have some inter interesting things to share we love to see it i want to thank you for accepting um that invitation and sharing your knowledge today and i hope that you know we had a number of persons who commented under the video um and if you may have catch this video after uh, our live please feel free to comment under the video as well um add your input um and again dr brown i want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us today i know that you were very busy you're moving from one job to the next and so i just want to thank you for taking the time out today to share your insight and share your knowledge and i'm hopeful and i most likely most definitely believe that someone would have gotten information that they may not have you know already uh know or known so i want to thank you for sharing with that sharing with us today You're You're and so if that um if you have no further comments we are going to end our session we're going to end our session on that good note. And I, um, Dr. Graham, I'm going to be looking on TikTok to see if you're going to put up those videos. You're doing this, you're doing that. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking. Yep, I'm going to be checking it out, Dr. Graham. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to our viewers for listening in. Like, share this video. Um, so that we can get the word out. We want to talk about the issues that are impacting us. These are so, this is very important. This is uh, very vital. Cervical cancer is something that we need to talk about. Many women are impacted. And so we, we want to talk about these issues that matter. So with that, we will end our session today. And can we talk? Can we talk? Thank you.